This is one of our pride and joys. It's the Altair 8800, and it's commonly referred to, although argued, that it's the first personal computer. There were machines that went before it, it's unquestionable, uh, but this one is considered the first for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the quantities it's solding. Uh, there was lots of them uh, made, they were kit form. Um, you could also buy it uh, ready-made as well. The most important thing about it is the two strands of computing that is sort of created uh, in that Bill Gates saw this machine and thought, this is fantastic, um, we can write software for this. It's not very usable as it is. We're gonna write a basic interpreter for it. And Microsoft was born. Uh, on the other side of the fence, People like Steve Jobs, uh, well not people like Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs actually saw this machine and, and thought well okay this is a start but it's not the computer I want, this, I want a machine that you could actually type on and comes up on the screen, that's where I see it going and it spurred Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak uh, into creating their machines, the Apple One and then the Apple Two and then everything else Apple. Um, so it's a really really important machine um, and a pivotal point in history all from this one machine in 1975. It's uh, an American machine made by a company called MITS and uh, these guys were originally sort of producing uh, sort of telemetry systems, remote control systems and things like that, um, but uh, they were having a very hard time and uh, the, the guy uh, behind MITS sort of decided that you know, he had to go to the bank and say, look, I'm going to need some more money otherwise we're going to hit the wall, um, but I do have an idea for a new product and it's a computer that you can build and uh, yeah. The, uh, he thought he might sell a few of them, um, but ended up selling huge numbers of them to a, a bunch of computer enthusiasts, basically. And it, actually, not so much computer enthusiasts, they weren't at that time, they were electronics enthusiasts. They didn't know they were computer enthusiasts until this thing had hit. So, um, yeah, uh, and uh, it sold a lot more than expected. Uh, and, uh, you know, MITS went on to produce sort of this version and sort of later versions as well, um, but really did inspire, you know, that generation into hacking these things and making them do really more than they were capable of at the time and hence the computer industry grew. In its original configuration it was really really rudimentary. Uh, you had no keyboard, you had no screen, you had these switches down the bottom here so you had access to the data bus there um, and you could toggle in data and you had access to the address bus and you could single step and load code into it and the data is shown out on these lines here so you programmed it in binary and you got your answers back in binary. You'd have the instructions set for the, the processor. Um, you could then uh, look up the opcodes. They would have a binary represent, representation. Uh, you toggle those in, step to the next location, put the next uh, opcode in. It's you know, very, very rudimentary machine code programming. Um, and as you got to know this machine and the, the opcode set for that uh, processor, you started to remember these things. Uh, and you remembered the kind of the pattern more than the actual uh, uh, the, uh, the numbers, but you remember those patterns, you could toggle in things reasonably quickly, um, but still hideously slow in today's sort of comparisons. So one of the first things um, that people remember doing with it, uh, of any great sort of shakes, um, was toggling in some code, which is basically just a lot of delay loops. Um, and a guy called Steve Dompier uh, took it to the homebrew club and uh, set it up on the, on the table, started toggling in his code, and um, Ultimately, it's got everybody sort of gathered around him, said, right, I'm going to run the code. Um, and this sort of program full of delay loops, you know how your, your phone can through and you get the buzzing noises when somebody's going to ring you? They used a, an FM radio at the time. The interference created by the processor and the circuitry interfered with the radio. So the longer the delay loop, the lower the buzz was on the radio. And the shorter the delay loop, the higher the buzz was. So yeah, doing that, you know, got it to play the Fall on the Hill, the old Beatles tune at the time. And people were, you know, oh, this is fantastic, you know, we've got this computer to do something. And this was one of the early stories that uh, sort of came about uh, from the, the Altair. Um, but it's a really intriguing machine because of, uh, you know, these stories that are associated with the, the, the people that were using it um, and, uh, and the stories of the Homebrew Club at that time, um, which, you know, created a whole group of people that created machines that changed their lives. Here's the big reveal. So this is the internals of our serial number three, um, and it's quite drastically different. It has a simple circuit board inside, just one circuit board with all the components on, um, and it had this connector at the back which allowed you to increase it to a massive 16K of memory uh, with that RAM pack. 